So, are you starting? So I'm talking to a camera. So what should I sit? Uh, no. Then where is the student? Uh, yeah. I think I should, I should sit here, right? I should. Where? Uh, I think here. Then where is the student? We sit here. Okay. Then where is the camera? I think you should find a place so that people can sit and see la. Your camera can adjust? Yes. So I sit here can? Okay, so uh, we'll begin our talk now. Uh, so maybe we can adjust and sit wherever you feel comfortable. Where should I? I should sit there. So, uh, so if you want to attend, if you want, if you want to have a talk, you can begin now. Uh, just find a place to sit, and we can discuss uh, on this session. So it's on. Okay. So uh, I I'm asked to uh, give a talk on something, uh, presumably mostly to the first year students. Um, so I'm thinking of a thinking of a topic which uh, should interest the first year students. So I I try to ask questions on your behalf. So the topics of today's talk uh, is something that is uh, why do you want to do physics? So I think there are two types of questions. There are two kinds of questions that uh, you may like to ask. Uh, the first is the question about physics in general. And the type, second type of question is about studying physics in USM as a student. So I think there are these two types of students, uh, uh, these two types of questions. Uh, so maybe I should start with uh, the, the questions of being a physics student in USM. And then we talk about uh, why doing physics in general? So I I have a little bit of time, maybe an hour or so. So I try to make my talk a little bit short, but I tend to drag on as usual, so that you can have more questions uh, with me. So I actually, what happened? I would be happy to to have questions, um, at question answer sessions. Uh, so first is uh, studying physics in USM. So there is a lot of questions that is related to these things. Uh, for example, how could you score your exam? Uh, there's many people want to ask. Then why do you want to score your exams? So you thought that exam is very important, so you want to just score it because this has been the kind of thing you are doing all the while. But they actually make much more than scoring the exams, physics. Um, then there are questions of uh, you need to be very smart, very good. In order to score your exam, you, you, do you have to be extremely uh, smart to be exam? 
to score exams. So this is another question that I can think of. I think I have prepared a set of questions in my slides, which I gave some time ago. So let me try to read out some of these questions and see if these questions resonate with you. So another thing is, if you graduate with a physics bachelor from USM, what can you do? If you want to make this true, then you would be jobless if you want to. But then these are questions that a lot of people ask. Then you also ask the questions of, say for example, you do a pure physics program, then you do an applied physics program. So what is actually the difference between these two? Anyone knows about the difference between pure physics and applied physics? Uh, well, I'm asking this question based on the structures of physics schools. So in physics school, you have this program, that program. Yeah, you are right. I think I told you the answer before, right? Yeah, so that's why you know these questions. Uh, and then the other question is that uh, what ha what what should you do if your uh, if your physics or your math is too weak? Are you good enough uh, in order to score the exam? See, in order to score the exam in physics schools, um, you need to be a little bit uh, smart for, for you to be excel in your class. How good you need to be good in your maths? How good will you have to be good in your physics in order to score? And um, so, so these are some questions. Uh, maybe I won't talk too much about this, but maybe some question that I think you, you may be interested to ask. Uh, that is uh, the difference between the physics study in USM and the physics or the study process that you have gone through when you was in the secondary school. So what is the main difference, the physics in the university? And the physics that you learn in, in SDPM or in matriculations. Well, most of the Malaysian they come from matriculations. You have gone through your pre-university courses in your country? Uh, I did A-levels. A-levels, okay. So A-levels is amount to the SDPM. So what would be the difference? Would there be a lot of difference between your SDPM physics and your first year physics courses? I don't think there's anything different between the one and one physics. Yeah, so many people would think that the the physics syllabus that you have uh, in the first year is very much similar to the one you have in your uh, A-levels. Uh, in a sense, it is true, but it depends, again, on the lecturers. So what the levels of the depth that you study depend very much on the lecturer. So some lecturers, they teach um, stuff which is similar to SDPM level. Uh, some lecturers, they teach something which is more difficult. So it all depends. So I think 110, for example, the calculus course, it could be a little bit more difficult. I'll add something which you have not seen in your SDPM. So it's more challenging in that sense. But uh, in 101, maybe it's just uh, taught at the SDPM level or slightly deeper. But in general, the, S, the first year courses are slightly deeper, but it depends on how deep the lecturers want to go in. For example, in your 101, you have this uh, a centripetal force. Um, you talk about circle in the motions. You could also have a circle in the motion which is not uniform. So that is not taught in the SCPM level, but uh, in the first year, that is included in a syllabus. Okay. So that is some question that is related to your course. So 
Another thing I want to let the students many years, every year we have the same problem. That is, the mathematics is just uh, not enough. The students' mathematics comprehension is just not enough. So to, to be good in physics, you need to be good in mathematics. So you ask yourself uh, whether you are good enough in your mathematics. Do you think you are good enough in your mathematics? I think most people who sit here, who come and take the trouble to listen to my talk, are those people who are interested. So most likely you are the person who are good in mathematics. Uh. So, but the, the worry is that those people who don't attend are normally those students who are not interested. So that is the majority of the students in the class. So that is, that is a concern as far as I can see. According to the every year uh, experience, the statistics in the School of Physics are almost the same every year. You have a small bunch of interested students like you, and that, but there's like a majority part of students who are not so interested in, in their Okay, so any other questions before I proceed on? Uh, yeah. If I'm concerned that I'm not good enough in mathematics, how can I get better? Okay, so uh, first you ask how good, how, how much mathematics you need to, to have in order to excel. And then the second question is that is your mathematics uh, sufficient uh, for this course? So my answer is this, uh, my answer is if you can uh, understand and pass your A-levels maths, and if you score quite well in your SCPM, if you score quite well in your uh, matriculation maths, you have enough knowledge for your mathematics. Okay, so the problem is what? Uh, the problem is the many uh, students, about 50% of the students, they cannot even achieve that level. So even though they come in as a very good uh, mathematics, uh, their results, they got an A, A min in the matriculations, but when you give them some maths questions, then they cannot answer even though it's a very straightforward maths. So my question is that if you sit here and you get your A levels to have an A or B, that is more than enough for your, for, for your uh, needs. Uh, but in the universities, you actually you would learn a little bit more mathematics than in your SCPM. So 101, 110 is very basic. It's only like form six level. Other than 110, the calculus, there are also many other uh, mathematic course like uh, like uh, linear algebra, vector analysis, complex uh, number, differential equations. So these are more advanced maths. So this kind of maths uh, is beyond your 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 uh, pre university level. So one one zero can be thought of like uh, slightly more advanced than your pre your pre u levels. Okay. So the problem is that when you go deeper and deeper into your first year, second year courses, then definitely the physics and the maths content will become more and more difficult. I would say that first year, second year the syllabus is manageable, it's not as difficult. It is still considered relatively easy. But when you go to second year, when you start to have, say, for example, statistical mechanics, when you start to have uh, complex numbers, differential equations, then a lot of students will start to, to fall behind. So that is the, the, the major concerns. I think in third year and fourth year, there are some specific courses where the demands uh, high levels of mathematical skills, like vector analysis, then a lot of students just cannot cannot catch up. Okay, so uh, this is something to do with your studies in in USM in general. Uh, so if, do you need to be uh, extremely uh, clever in order to to be a, a physicist? Right. So for students who comes into university in USM, uh, to, to make physics as your major, th there's a small minority of them wants to become a physicist. Then the other majority of them come in just for their own particular reasons, mainly because they just want to, want to have an easy course 
or just want to have a degree, then they go out to, to work. So I always ask students, when, what do you want? So when I was a student, I I went into physics department in Uni Somalia. I have very simple intention. I just want to become a physicist. I, yeah, this is just what I want. But then you have your own agenda. So if you do not know what you want when you come into this university, uh, then you, start, you have to start thinking. Do you want to become a physicist or professions in physics? If not, then what do you want? That, that will help a lot in determining your future, okay? So if you, for example, know that you want to become a very good physicist in the future, then what you need is to uh, strengthen your basic knowledge uh, throughout your studies in USM. But maybe not everyone wants to become a physicist. Uh, if you don't want to become a physicist, then what do you want? Anyone can share with me why do you want to come into the schools of physics? I mean, when you say becoming a physicist, okay. working as a physicist, there is no job as a physicist. Uh, yeah, there is no job as a physicist. There's a research position, but it's not called physicist. What actually you mean by physicist? Uh, what I mean by physicist is, yeah, you got a good, good question. Uh, the best defined define, define physicist that you, you find a position where you uh, become a researcher in physics. And that kind of people is very, very minor. I think maybe less than 1% or 2% of those uh, PhD holders would end up as a physicist. So a physicist on usually uh, requires a PhD, hold, a PhD degree. So then when you study for many, many years, you have studied for four years of an undergraduate, then you study for, let's say, two years for your master, then you have to study for another three to four years for your PhD. So you would graduate with a PhD at the age of roughly 30, where your friends, your peers all uh, have their own cars, have their own family, have their own house. And then you are still uh, single and you're still depressed uh, and struggle with your research. Um, so it is not a very easy uh, road to travel if you want to become a physicist. Uh. Okay, so there is no job well defined for physicists. So it is difficult. Go to get a permanent job. I think that is the issue. Um, so either you stay back in the academics in the university or research institute to continue your pursuit in your physics research. Um, that kind of chance is quite limited, especially in a university or research institute. The openings are always very really little, but the numbers of candidates who want to work in these uh, institutes are uh, a lot. So the competition is very high, especially in overseas. Um, as you go to Australia, there's this amount of vacancy, but there's this big amount of candidates who want to fill the vacancy, and the competition is always very high. But let's say if you don't want to be continue as academics, uh, you can always leave the academics, but you join the private sector. Then uh, you have a whole big new world open for you. Then you may excel in this non-academic line. A lot of people who PhD graduate, graduate with a PhD in physics would work in the private sectors and then they become very, very smart. Lah. Okay, so um, before I continue on, any other questions you want? Yeah. So, uh, there's actually, from what I know, there's a lot of funders for physicists, such as astrophysicists, theoretical mm. physicists. So, which one do you consider yourself as? Uh, what type of physicists? Okay, so that's a good question. Sir. So, that, that makes our discussion more concrete. Let's just talk about physics. Uh, physics can be categorized in many uh, ways. Your basics. I think that is your, all your basics at least at the
uh, survey level. First year, second year, you strengthen your survey level. Then you build up all your fundamental knowledge in physics. All branches of physics requires all this fundamental knowledge. Basically, four types of fundamental physics that you have to master as an undergraduate. So the first is classical mechanics. Mechanics. So your 101 is mechanic, but it's not really that kind of mechanics we're talking about. That mechanics that you learn 101 is very, um, very surface on the surface. Uh, we talk about uh, classical dynamics, Lagrangians, theoretical mechanics. So the mechanics is a major branch. Second is quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics you learn in 205. Um, then you have to Experimentalists, you need to know all this stuff. It's all you go to anywhere in the university. All the university will teach the same courses. Uh, these two, these four courses. Ex the difference would be that some university teach it in a very deep level, some university teach it at a very shallow, shallow level. Okay, so I haven't answered your question yet, huh? uh, So, what kinds of physics uh, you you can have? Um, so basically, you divide the physics into two types. Uh, class uh, theoretical physics and uh, experimental physics. So basically, this is these two types of uh, branches, uh, especially in USM. So we have, I think, four people, five people who are pure, pure uh, theoreticians. Then the rest are experimentalists. Experimentalists mean that they are not doing pure theory; they do data. But computational physics, computational physics is particularly uh, intensive in using computer to solve uh, physics problem. They do not use it only to solve simple uh, data manipulation, but they use it intensively to extract physics from 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 the theory. So um, I consider myself as a theorist. Uh, then, uh, but then I changed to become a computational uh, physicist. So then let me further, uh, I do not know much about the experimental physicists. So experimental physicists are experiment, are exper are physicists who do a lot of uh, experiments, carry out, many, carry out uh, measurements. So I don't know much about experimental physicists, but my uh, command is that if you want to become a good experimentalist, you better be good in your, in your theoretical physics. So if you are good in your theoretical physics, then you will be able to, to do much more deeper things. For example, when I was in doing my PhD um, in overseas, the person who lectures uh, a theoretical uh, subject on general theory of relativity is an experimentalist. So he's ex he was an experimentalist, and yet he was so good in his theory. So the, the kind of experiment that he did or could be could be very very deep. Okay, so that is experimental experimental physics. Uh, but then the other types of experiments that I would consider as also experimentalists are people who use uh, electronics, like Prof. Jubia. So they they are they use uh, Arduino. They use electronics. Uh, so it's not really investigating the physics, but they use uh, electronics. So I'm a theorist. I was trained as a theoretical physicist. So when you talk about theoretical physicist, then I it's my topic. Lah. Uh, so theoretical physics can have many many branches. Uh, so the branch I have that I, I I went into in the beginning is called theoretical high energy physics. It is a branch where they try to understand what is the fundamental constituent of matter. What are the physics? 
that governs the fundamental constitution of matter. So um, they use a lot of quantum field theory uh, and uh, mathematics group theory to describe what actually is the physics behind the material world. Uh, so that is one very big subject. Superstring is considered one type of uh, high energy physics as well. Uh, where they, they use pure theoretical tools to investigate the universe. So physicists like us, we, we have this kind of belief uh, that the universe is uh, governed by a set of physical principles. So we call it physical law. So the job of a high energy physicist is to try to find out the fundamental laws that governs our uh, physical universe. Um, then uh, we think that we know quite a bit of the law that govern the universe, the material universe, uh, but there are still a lot of aspect that is not known. So the laws should uh, not only govern the microscopic behaviors of matter, but also governs the whole universe itself. So we believe that there are these physical principles and mathematics that governs our universe. And if you think about it, uh, uh, this is a very big achievement for humankind. Like you're sitting here, you're just a small tiny bit of human sitting on a small earth that is a small bit in the whole universe. And yet the intellectuals of human beings is able to comprehend the law that governs from the very microscopic of the would be dealing with the whole cosmos, the whole universe. So then people would actually think uh, uh, the physical law that governs the very tiny particles, like the elementary particles, quarks and atoms and electrons, is so tiny, it's when one extremes, uh, the times the, the length scale is like 10 to the power of minus I don't know, 30 something centimeter. And the cosmology is is the largest scale they can think of that describes the whole universe. So these two types of uh, scenario would be totally independent from each other. That is what you think, but actually it's not. The evolution much on the structures of the, of the matter at the very fundamental level. So they are actually tightly related. Do you know why is that they're so tightly related? This is the cosmology is so big, but the quarks and leptons are so small. How could that, these two be related? The, there, are two, there, are four, there are four forces in the fundamental universe. Uh, so there are four fundamental forces in the universe. There are these uh, no, electromagnetic quarks forces called gluons, electroweak forces, and in gravity. Okay, so these are the forces that governs every single uh, atoms, every single uh, basic constituent of matter. Um, then, but the whole universe is a big one. It's governed by John, the general theory of relativity. So they are, they are closely related because the evolutions of the whole universe uh, depend very much on the, on the, no, 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 the, the Big Bang is part of the cosmology. It depends very much on the physical content of our material universe. So if the materials world at the fundamental level, uh, the loss is uh, slightly different then the evolutions of the Big Bang from the Big Bang until now will be very different. For example, if the numbers of neutrino is four types instead of three types, then uh, the, 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 during the Big Bang, after the Big Bang, there's a period where it expands very rapidly and then it, cool, it expands and it cools down. So the, the content of our fundamental particles will decide when the decoupling happened. The decoupling is a period where, where, where the light and the materials, they fall out of each other in thermal equilibrium. So in the very beginning, when everything is very hot, the light, that is the photon and the materials, they are in the thermal equilibrium. So they, they mix each, into each other and you cannot uh, separate the light from the matter because the light and matter interact so strongly. Uh, very, very hot. Uh, but when the universe is expanding, then the temperature will fall, will become colder. 
and there will be a time when it's so cool that the photon and the materials will not be in thermal equilibrium anymore. So when they start to separate, then the universe will evolve, uh, will go into another phase, the coupling phase, when the materials, the structures will start to form. Okay, so then the universe suddenly become transparent. So that period is very crucial. If it's too early or if it's too late, then it will affect what happens after that. So for example, in order for the life, for the structures of the um, galaxy to form, it takes some time, it takes a little bit of time to form too late. Then, then the formations of these structures would not have enough time to evolve into this stage. So if it's happening too early, then a lot of other things will happen. So the content of the particle physics will determine the phases of the cosmology during the thermal history. So that is a very closely related uh, area. Okay, so that is cosmology and high energy physics. Uh. So um, let me introduce to you the other, ex other theoretical physics. Um, like Dr. Edmund is not here, so he is an expert in quantum uh, mechanics. So um, quantum mechanics is another very uh, big aspect of the, the microscopic world is governed by this physical law of quantum mechanics. So the quantum mechanics is a very complicated theory, but uh, people have been using it uh, very routinely to, to, to explain all the microscopic behaviors that happens in the very small scale. Um, and this law is very, very weird. Um, so people are nowadays using more and more quantum mechanics for their, uh, to discover new phenomena in quantum information theory, in new uh, invention that make use of quantum effects. So quantum uh, theories has been um, developed since 100 years ago, but only very recently, I mean the last 10 years or so, the quantum mechanics is taking another leap and it going into another area where the quantum mechanics would provide a lot of new, uh, new applications which is not possible in before. For example, people are talking about uh, having quantum uh, computers. So quantum computers is a very big aspect that may change the whole world. Uh, the quantum computers is based on the principle of quantum mechanics and the behaviors of quantum mechanics is totally different from the behavior of conventional uh, computers. So quantum mechanics itself is a big uh, area and uh, not, people, not many people in Malaysia are doing that kind of research. So Dr. Edmund Lowe is in that. Lah. Okay. So other than this, you also have another branches of uh, theoretical physics, which I, I, I can only think of a few. Lah. So I'll talk about quantum mechanics, talk about uh, uh, cosmology, uh, high energy physics. And there are also these optics. Uh, I think Dr. Emma is also doing quantum optics, where they apply the laws of quantum mechanics onto light. Um, but at your level, you, you, you don't really go into that kind of uh, field at the moment until you go into uh, the, 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 your PhD study. Another branch that is emerging, the latest branch that is emerging, is to apply artificial intelligence, neural network in physics. So neural networks is a kind of uh, computational method that is used to, uh, for programming purpose. Okay, so we talk about artificial intelligence, um, uh, pattern recognition and things like that. So most of these are uh, computing technologies that is used that is used uh, for 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 practical purpose uh, like in the manufacturing they use pattern recognitions to sort out those um, products that is defective and those is not defective they use artificial intelligence to to recognize your face and to sort out who is bad guy who is the good guys and things like that. But then there is a new branching uh, a branch where they apply quantum mechan they apply uh, artificial intelligence into solving quantum mechanical problem. So quantum mechanics. Uh, so let me talk about a little bit about quantum mechanics. Um, 
in principle, uh, all the materials that are made of our material worlds at the microscopic levels, they are all governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. So you write down the equation that, that governs these behaviors. For example, electrons in an atoms or atoms inside a solid or atoms in, in a gas. Um, any material you can think of that is made of atoms, they are all governed by the set of quantum mechanics. So you can write down the equation that govern them, call it high, uh, Schrodinger equations. So you write down the Schrodinger equations that describes the behaviors of all the atoms in a collective manner. Um, if in principle, in principle, if you can solve the equations, you can predict their behaviors, and the behavior can be very, very weird. Uh, but the problem is that the quantum mechanics, uh, many body problems, uh, cannot be solved exactly. Uh, cannot be solved theoretically, so it have to be solved using a very intensive computational method. So computational physics, uh, one of the um, one of the major tasks of computational physics is to solve uh, the quantum many body problems. So quantum equations uh, is very complicated. People use different types of intensive computational method to solve it, to predict uh, the behaviors of say um, silicons or metals. But the predictions uh, cannot be very accurate uh, because the equations of quantum mechanics is just too complicated. It contains this kind of thing called, uh, called uh, non-local interactions. So because of these non-local interactions, the, the, the mathematics uh, just have to be solved using approximations. And this approximation leads to uh, errors in the prediction. But with the inventions of artificial intelligence, nowadays it seems that it is possible to solve the quantum many body problem using artificial intelligence. So if that is a possibility, that means uh, you can predict everything uh, because all the materials, all the atoms are made up of, uh, can, be con con can be described by quantum mechanics. And if you can solve the quantum mechanics problem exactly, then uh, you can basically know everything about the, mat the materials. So example for example, if I give you a piece of uh, metal, uh, say uh, whatever crystal you can think of, uh, what is the physical properties of these materials? Uh, say, for example, how hard it is. If you shine a light on it, what is the uh, refractive index? Uh, if you apply a magnetic field to it, what is the response of this material uh, to this, to this uh, uh, external magnetic field? So basically, uh, all the materials that we can think of are governed by quantum mechanics. And in principle, you can predict the properties of all the physical materials by solving the quantum mechanics problem. You may, you may not feel very um, surprised about this, but in, when I first thought about this, heard about this, it, it's a big impact to me because say I give you a piece of diamond. You want to know what is the, say, the hardness of the diamond. So what do you do usually? You just measure it. Uh, if you have um, uh, a crystal, you want to know whether it has uh, non-linear optical modes or not. So you just measure it. But what I'm telling you is that quantum mechanics can actually predict the physical properties, all physical properties of it, if you can solve the quantum mechanics. So in principle, you do not need to measure it. But by knowing the uh, method to solve short equations, you're able to predict it. Lah. So that kind of predictions, uh, it's only become a reality in the last, maybe last 20 years ago. But now with the inventions of artificial intelligence, then we may be able to get closer, to get a more accurate descriptions. For example, if you are talking about the conventional computational method, I think only up to like 47 atoms, system of 47 atoms, um, you can solve the Schrodinger equations of these 47 atoms and then make a very uh, correct predictions about it. But if the systems become larger, then it's not possible to solve it using the most powerful computer on Earth. But with neural network or with artificial intelligence, then you may be able to solve this. Uh, so my conclusion is this. Uh, the physical world 
is governed by this set of physical law. And if you can solve this physical law, then you can describe, you can know uh, what are the behaviors of the physical universe, uh, how to model them, how to explain them, how to predict them. And your job as a student in the physics schools is to learn all these different uh, laws that we have already known. And then you learn this case by case. For example, you learn electromagnetism, E and M. So electromagnetism uh, round up all the physical law that involve electric charges. And then you learn thermodynamics. So thermodynamics gives you a set of principles that allows you to calculate the energy flow. Right? Um, so you learn all these different aspects. But you, what are you learning is actually uh, the, the laws, the natural laws that governs our universe. So it's not like you, if you go to do uh, accounting, like you learn about Malaysian accounting law, or you go to become a lawyer, you learn about uh, Malaysian law. Uh, that law only applies to, to a certain society. Uh, the law may be absolute, uh, obsolete, it may be uh, not relevant if you move to another planet or if you move to another country. But universal law is not like that. Universal law has been there and established since the beginning of the universe. And in the future, the law is more, will be more or less the same. Well, we are talking about a set of very, very different laws governing different aspects of our materials. Right. So your, you are studying all these aspects, like thermodynamics, uh, quantum mechanics, electromagnetism, um, and also other, other principles. Huh? And the, in order to study this set of laws, you need to have a language to study them in details. So you study them using mathematics. Uh, in the early days of the development of philosophy, the natural philosophy, uh, the ancient Greeks also tried to understand the physical universe around them. They look at the stars, they look at the motions of objects on Earth, they look at uh, the pendulums. Then they try to comprehend the physical universe. They try to derive the physical laws that governs the universe. So that was like 3,000 years ago. But their achievement in understanding the physical universe is actually very shallow. It cannot go beyond their, their senses. So the eye can see it that far. Uh, they, the eye can see that small. They cannot penetrate beyond what they can see, the smallest specks. They cannot see too far away. They cannot see, for example, uh, the holes on the moons and things like that. Uh, that is limited by the physical uh, limitations because they don't have experimental apparatus. So that is not their fault. But the most serious fault is that they are lacking uh, mathematical tools uh, for them to describe the mathematical, uh, to describe the behaviors uh, in a more quant quantitative manner. Uh, what I mean by quantitative manner is that you try to understand the law and describe the physical law in language of mathematics. So with the mathematical descriptions, uh, you can capture all the physical features of the physical law, then you can predict what will happen. Then uh, if you have new things coming in, you can add in interactions. So you have a, a very uh, powerful tools for you to understand what this physical law is. But in the ancient day, they don't have this physical law. They, no, they, they, have, they try to understand the physical law, but they don't have mathematics to help them to do that. Uh, so a lot of time, their understandings are very limited. For example, they thought that the larger the stone, the faster it will fall. So that is according to your intuition. It looks very, very real. The larger the stone is, the faster it falls. But this is not true according to Newton's law. You know, whether it's large stone or small stones, it, the rate of falling is actually the same. Okay. So that is an example where they, they come to the wrong conclusion without the tools of mathematics. So things change, I think, during the times of Galileo and after that, during the time of Newton, where the first generation of natural philosopher, we call it natural philosopher, we now call it physicists. So they introduce uh, mathematics as their tools. So with the Newton's law invented, so he made the calculus in order to describe the physical law that he tried to describe. So this uh, mathematics, allows them, allows the physicists to go beyond 
uh, the census. So that's why your mathematics is very powerful, is very, very important. Without mathematics, you cannot see, cannot predict a lot of things. You can only predict that much of things, but those that is behind the behaviors, you just cannot uh, comprehend. An example would be the laws, uh, a formula discovered by Dirac. Uh, he used a law of symmetry, uh, so he demand the law to be symmetrical. Uh, they call it the Lorentz symmetry. And based on that requirement, he write down the mathematics that is required to describe uh, particles, which is relativistic, that has a charge. So he take over the short equations, and then he generalized it to special relativistic case. And based on this mathematics uh, that he invented, he invented the matrix. Then he predicted that the existence of positron and then it was discovered later. So positron is antiparticles of electron. So based on mathematical structures, he can predict the existence of what they call antiparticles. And you cannot imagine the antiparticles in our physical world because we never see one in our real life. But mathematics predicts are based on the consistent constructions of the laws that it predicts this existence, and then they found it. So there's an example of how powerful uh, mathematics is. So you, in order to describe the physical laws, you need to use mathematics. Right? Okay, so uh, any other questions? I, I will actually, yes, Dr. Lai Li. I want to know, what is the physical law that governs the Earth or any other planet that is orbiting the sun at an angle? Okay, so the question from Dr. Nolani is that uh, the, the sun is in the center in the solar, solar systems and then planets are orbiting around the sun. So the orbits uh, define a plane where the sun is in the, in the middle. Right? So imagine you have a planets around the sun. Uh, you're talking about the... Yeah, so, uh, the tilt, so the plane defined by the orbits of the sun is a two-dimensional plane. But then the orbits of the Earth is like, like this, and it is circulate, it's uh, going around in its axis. So the axis define a directions, and so happen that the axis of the direction is just rotating, is not 90 degrees with respect to the plane of the Earth around the sun. It has a uh, tilt angle. So my answer to this question is that it would, I think the easy answer is that it would not be 90 degree, it would be tilted in general. It's just like uh, you throw a coin randomly and the chance that the coin will fall on the edge will be difficult. So I think this is more or less like a probability. Now the property is like this, the, 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 the question can be generalized into this. Why is that the sun, uh, why is the earth is moving at this speed? Why is not at another speed? Uh, why is the, the sun, the earth is rotating at this rate? but not at another rate. Uh, the answer is determined by the initial condition when the system is formed. So there are two things that many people may get confused. The physical laws that governs the, the evolutions of the physical system and the initial conditions. Initial conditions can be random, but the law is fixed. Like F equals to MA is a fixed law, but uh, the initial condition that you provide to the particles that is moving, it could start from a rest, it could start from a non-rest position. So that is initial law. So different initial laws uh, would, would evolve into a different system. So the answer is, it's determined by initial condition. And initial condition is random in the beginning. So we do not know what is initial condition. But according to Newton's, he believed that it was set by God. So it's God that set initial conditions. They call it the first, they call it the, the first uh, motion or whatever. Then he set the initial condition and it tick. Then the, the clock starts to evolve. Then we have our universe. That is what Newton's believed in the beginning. But then Stephen Hawking came out later to, to de deny that you need a, uh, in the initial condition is not set by God and something like that. So you have uh, arguments. Then the argument can go into another regime. Do we physicists uh, believe in God and things like that? Then the argument will go on and on. So the universe is governed by a set of, uh, set of fixed law. But the... The actual evolutions determined by 
different initial conditions. So it, is, it could be the same law, but if you set up with different conditions, initial condition, then the evolution will be different. Yeah? Uh, so yeah, I had a question. Uh, as far as I've heard, according to quantum mechanics, like we cannot predict, as you said, we cannot predict how they work. So for quantum computers, they don't, they don't always give a set answer. There's only probability that you'll get this answer. So how could they replace or how could they be used uh, to compute? Uh, first of all, it's not that quantum mechanics cannot make uh, predictions. I think for some quantities, it can give a very accurate predictions. Uh, the uncertainty is just a fuzziness in the predictions. But uh, I think in practice, you do some design, some very clever designs. Uh, that uncertainty in the quantum mechanics uh, would not show up in the quantum computation. I think there is a very clever way to avoid uh, this fuzziness in the quantum. Of course, uh, Fuzziness in quantum mechanics is built in. So if you measure the position, you cannot know the the, the, the momentum exactly. Uh, but I think in quantum computer, it's not it's it's not it's not this. I think they have a very clever way. I do not know exactly what the clever way, but there's a clever way to try to extract information from the quantum state. So I think what you understand, what what you are trying is that if you have a quantum uh, bits qubits in a certain state, you want to know what is the state and then want you to measure it. When you measure it, then necessarily you will perturb it, then you will cause it to change. So, so that kind of perturbation may cause the quantum computers to become not accurate. But people define different types of uh, very clever way uh, to measure the, the quantum states without destroying. So, the, so there was two kinds of argument last time. One, one, one side would, would argue against the possibility of quantum computers. You'll never be able to be a quantum computer because necessarily when you interact with it, you destroy the quantum information. That is the fuzziness. Then the other groups of people will keep on trying different uh, clever way to make measurements. And I think that people are actually getting close to build a new quantum computers by designing new ways. So there was a joke saying that uh, if you have a quantum computer, when you want to measure it, you, you press a button. But when you press a button, you cannot see it. You just have to press like this. Okay, how do you expect physics in the future? Uh, so this is a very big uh, question. People have been talking about these questions. What is the future of physics? Uh, so people have been talking about that physics uh, is coming to its end. This kind of uh, argument was being mentioned many times in the history. So uh, the earlier uh, history would be the claim by Lord Calvin. So during the classical uh, classical physics, sorry, uh, before the inventions of quantum mechanics, uh, there was a peak of classical mechanics, classical physics. So Lord Calvin, Lord Calvin was the person who whom you use as a label for the degree. So he famously declared that the physics is coming to an end because all the physical law has been known to that time at that time. So, but then it was proven wrong because uh, the black body radiation and, and a list of other experiments uh, proved that the classical mechanics cannot solve that kind of observation. So I had to invent uh, new quantum mechanics. So with the invention of new quantum mechanics coming in, uh, then it's proven that the, the, the law of physics is not, not finished, discovered yet. Um, so then people, uh, has been uh, trying to learn as much physics as possible, trying to discover new physics. Then uh, very recently people would think that uh, basically we have known quite a bit of the physical laws. Most of the physical law that uh, we have gathered these days uh, can more or less uh, describe most of the things that we know. Only in some extreme cases where we cannot know the physics. The most notable situ uh, example would be on uh, quantum gravity. We do not know what happens inside the black holes because uh, in order to, to understand what happens inside the black holes, which is singularity, you have, to, you have to explain the consistency between general relativity and quantum mechanics. So people do not know what is quantum gravity. So if you found quantum gravity, then probably it will be the end of the universe, uh, the end of the physics. But it's something which is very speculative. So uh, Stephen Hawking gave a talk on the end of uh, the physics, something like that. 
when he, he, he was inaugurated as a location professor, I think 1980 or 1982. So he talks about that. So he, he, he thought that uh, the, by that time, I think super gravity is the answer. So if you have super gravity, then you solve quantum, quantum gravity, and then, uh, then all the physics that we need to know is already known. But now, generally, people, people uh, think that uh, there's still a lot of unknown which yet to be explored. Uh, but then there, there's another uh, topic about uh, the end of the physics uh, very recently, as new articles, uh, which argues in a different directions. It says that uh, the physics that we know today uh, are governed by very complicated equations. So uh, we cannot explain, we cannot solve these complicated equations. Uh, but with the inventions of uh, computational physics, with big computers, powerful computers, then it's possible to solve the quantum computers, or use quantum computers or computational physics method to solve all those complicated equations that exist but cannot be solved. So they call this the end of uh, theoretical physics because in the olden days, the, uh, the, com the conventional approach is to solve the theory analytically. Uh, they have these three dimension, three dimensional icing models and these complicated models, Hubbard models, uh, then they solve it using lengthy calculation like this tax, this, this thick stacks of equations using theoretical method. But people find that no, it's just not possible to solve these equations to predict the behaviors of uh, the, the material universe. But with the invention of computational physics, then all these difficulty in the past can be solved. So basically, it's an end of uh, complicated calculations. In the olden day, you cannot solve complicated equations, but these days you can solve complicated equations. So, so that is another end of physics. But as far as personally, I feel, I see, I don't see any end because uh, we do not know many many fundamentals uh, equations. So, if you look at the internet, I think I I prepared a list of questions in the internet in the theory in the physics theory uh, group webpage. So a list of fundamental questions that has not been answered with mystery. Quantum gravity is one, and there's a lot of uh, other fundamental questions in elementary particle physics which is not yet solved. For example, uh, this hierarchy problem, uh, uh, is there a super string at the fundamental level? What is the fundamental constituent of matter? Is this quark? Is this Latin? It's actually not known. It is a super string, it's not known. So this is a dilemma. We cannot provide any answer to these questions uh, using any existing experimental approach. So it's just like a, a, a desert. It says you are trapped on a desert and you cannot travel beyond the, 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 the boundary of the desert. So to you, the desert extends infinitely. So you do not know whether there is an end to the desert. Is that beyond the horizon, uh, you can arrive at a um, uh, can you can can you go out from the desert or not? You just cannot tell from this point of view. So this is like the theoretical physics problem. We do not know what is the end. We just predict there's the end. For example, we predict there is a super string at the end of the boundary there. But you cannot in any way experimentally verify the existence of the string. So in a sense, it's very very embarrassing because you are predicting some nice solution but you never be able to justify the, the solutions. It's just like, uh, it's like you know, analogy, maybe it's not a good analogy. You believe in God, and God is so nice, but you cannot prove its existence. It's like a super string. You expect it to happen, but you never be able to prove it. Lah. Yeah. So, personally for you, do you believe in quantum relativity or string theory to explain I am okay. So the question is, uh, question is, uh, do I believe in a super string to be the solution of quantum gravity? Uh, I am not in the position to answer that questions because I am not trained in that manner. Maybe next year there will be a, a USM staff coming back from, yeah, call uh, the name of uh, Dr. Husni. So he is trained as a quantum gravity uh, physicist from uh, from UK from, from Imperial College. So he will be able to answer your question. So that will be interesting. 
but the 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 concepts that is involved are very very abstract. Even I myself would not be able to understand it. So the way people the way done super strings construct the theory is really something which is beyond our comprehensions. So I do not know, but there is another counter arguments saying that there might be no fundamental constituent of matter. Because in the history we was thinking we have these uh, atoms, molecules made of atoms, atoms made up of uh, even smaller particles, electrons and protons. Proton inside, you have uh, quarks. So we are always zooming in and expect a more fundamental constituent of matter. Uh, then they thought super string is the most fundamental one. Different vibrational modes of string correspond to different type of particles. Uh, mathematically, you can construct it, it's very beautiful. But there's another very unconventional viewpoint that is challenging that kind of thinking. Namely, there's no elementary particles. Uh, it's a collective behavior, what they call emergent phenomena. I cannot tell where exactly what you mean by emergent phenomena, but basically it means all the particles that we see are a result of a collective, uh, co co collective behavior. But things fall together, there are mutual interactions at the large scales give rise to the illusion that there are elementary particles. But these are actually not elementary at all. If you take away all the interactions in a group, then there's no, nothing left. There's no elementary particles there. So this is another challenging, uh, there's another challenging viewpoint uh, called emergent phenomena. So uh, you have uh, studies in high elementary. So uh, from the past, we define the smallest particle as atom then Okay, so the so the question is that if you can we find smaller and smaller particles, uh, so we we start from large one molecules and then we thought there are smaller and smaller particles. So the question to answer is a bit technical. So you have to first ask, how do you know the existence of a smaller structures inside the atoms? So it's just like, I see you because I can receive photon reflecting from you into my eye. So I can probe you through the media of photon. Uh, so if I'm blind and if there's no photon comes into my eye, I cannot see you. In other words, in order to see the structures, you need to provide a probe and then receive the response from the probe. So this is what we do. Like you have the lab, and you create particles, and that particles will interact with the target. Then the target will be colliding with the projectiles, and from the scattering of the projectiles, an outcome. Then you try to figure out what happened inside the target. So you, if you use uncertainty principle that you would estimate in 104, uh, you can actually show that the smaller the size of the particles you want to probe, the larger the momentum you have, right? delta P, delta X, larger than H bar. So if you want to go into a deeper levels of the structure of matter, you need to use a higher energy. So it so happened that the atoms can be probed uh, by using energies of photon, electron of uh, I think 0 0.1 EV or 0 0.01 EV, which is a very low. So that's why you see light, because light can be excited. So the energy levels, the energy scale is very low. So if you want to probe into a nucleus, that is higher energy required. You need about 1 MeV of energy. That is energy released by a radioactive nuclei. That kind of energy of MeV is energy scales related to uh, nuclear physics. If you want to see nucleus, you need to probe it with particles which has energy of about a few MeV. So you can have uh, MeV particles quite easily using uh, radiations uh, source or using accelerators. Um, but then when you probe into nucleus of neutron, then you want to see deeper. Um, the structures high hidden inside a nucleon is even smaller. So you want to see it, you have to use high energy particles. So instead of uh, MeV particle accelerators is not enough, you have to accelerate using big as synchrotons, synchrotons of um, 1000 times stronger, which is at the GeV level. Uh, not yet GeV. So after that GeV, I think that was built in the 60s. Then they use protons and then hit into the mesons and then they probe into the structures. Then they see something more small fundamentals. When they raise the particles to a few hundred GeV 
100 over GeV, 100 GeV. Then they see uh, the the most basic constitutive of matter as quarks. So so you keep on building larger and larger particles accelerator. The largest one we have is about uh, one to ten TeV in uh, CERN or in these large hadron colliders. So it accelerates up to maybe like 10 GeV. No, I think what 10 TeV, less than TeV. Yeah, TeV is 1,000 times GeV, which is tremendous. Uh, TeV is tera GeV. So with that, you can probe even deeper, but you never be able to probe it with higher energy because the human economy can sustain that kind that I think mean, don't know how many kilometers 50 kilometers 30 kilometers of circumference you cannot go higher because it takes too much time too much money so if you want to prop into let's say 1000 TeV then you may have to build a accelerator which is could be as large circumference as the radius of the of the earth and you want to be larger then you have to build an orbit swan which is like so it is practically impossible to build accelerator which go beyond I think 100 TeV. At the moment, the max you get is at 10 TeV. So that is where you stop. You cannot probe it further anymore. So you never know what happens inside the particles. So whether there is a prion inside a quarks or not, it is practically not accessible. Whether it's a string inside is practically not accessible. If you were to use a control accelerator to probe it. So we are running out of uh, probe. So you just have to rely on theory because theory can probe in as, as large as uh, the Planck scale. The largest possible energy scale that is possible is 10 to the power of 16, 10 to the power of 19 GeV. We call it Planck scale. That's the largest possible energy scale that's possible. So if you go beyond the Planck scale, then it becomes something which is very bizarre. So we were never able to probe into that. So superstring is not is known to, to be probed. Uh, if you have an energy probe, that is as large as 10 to the power of 19 GeV, which is impossible. So it's just like the desert scenario. You <laughs> thought that there's a there's a something there's water outside the boundary, but you never be able to prove it. So it's so people resort to theory. You construct all sorts of theories uh, to fulfill. So you use mathematical consistency and mathematical ability to construct a theory, and you have to make people to believe it. And people, some people believe it, some people don't believe it. Um, so what do you do? You look at the sky, you look at big bangs, collision. No, you look at collisions between black holes because these are very, 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 very uh, energetic uh, behaviors. Uh, by looking at these galactic uh, collisions, that may be another scenario where you can probe into the basic structure of matter. But that kind of probe is not the kind of probe you can control, and it's very far. The measurement of the signal is very, very difficult, very weak. So to draw a concrete conclusion of what happens in that inside black holes is very difficult because you cannot control the energy, the resolution you measure is very slow. So it's again practically difficult to, to, to probe what happens. Uh, so that is one scenario that is very frustrating. It has been like this for the last 30 years. We, know that we can never push beyond a TV scale to know what actually is there. It's just speculations. So that is my answer. So it's... This is science, it's not the answer to everything, but it has to admit that it has limitations. So whatever I say is depend on what we have in experiments. So I won't claim that it's a super string because we've actually never seen it. Maybe it's uh, time uh, already? Next week we will be having uh, coffee talk again by Dr. Yoon. Huh. Is it next week? Yeah, next week. Okay. Two of yeah, next week. Uh, the topic is about particle physics. So if you have any other questions, you know. Uh, excuse me, uh, sir. I, I would like one of the four fundamental forces. One of them is considered to be gravity. Okay. But according to Einstein's theory, gravity is not a force. It's just distortion of space-time. So this is still considered uh, force. Okay. So the question is, uh, gravity is one of the four fundamental forces. But the gravity is kind of uh, different from the three other types of forces. So three other types of forces can well be described by quantum field theory. The gluons, um, which mediates the color force, the, the weak forces, and the electromagnetic forces. So they are mediated by uh, group theories. So we can quantize them. So they describe by quantum mechanics very well. But gravitational force uh, is not quantized. It cannot 
cannot merge with these three forces together. Uh, so you try to quantize it, you try to treat the gravitational force as like you treat the other three type of forces. The gravitational force is like way too weak compared to three other type of forces. So when you quantize the gravitational force, you have this graviton, then you end up with a lot of infinities. So people cannot reconcile uh, this problem. That is, people try to use quantum field theory to treat gravity, but then they end up at infinity. So there's no consistent theory that could be derived from quantum gravity. So, uh, so that is this, uh, this, this scenario which is always troubling uh, physicists. So there could be some very, very smart people who try to unite gravity forces and the three other forces. They call it a theory of everything. Theory of everything in a specific manner means the unifications of the three fundamental forces and the gravity. The three forces, the unification of three forces, the weak forces, uh, strong force, and electromagnetic force is called the GUT, the GUT, Grand Unified Theory. Grand Unified Theory plus the gravity is called theory of everything. So at the moment, we don't have a, a quantum gravity. And if you were able to show the reconciliations and if you can prove it beyond doubt that this is the theory, then you get a Nobel Prize. So on and off, people will come up with some quantum gravity theory that shows that it works. Then after some time, people just forget about it. So you may want to be one, then you get a Nobel Prize. Okay? So you get your face on So I think that's all. I have been talking too, too long. So maybe next week. Yeah, so next week we will have another talk on uh, what is the basic constituent of matter. Basically, it's part of what you ask your questions. Uh, so, uh, uh, for every week, we'll be having math center for those who, who need uh, math stuff. Uh, every, I think, every Tuesday and Thursday, I'll go through with Dr. Nottingham again. So, if you have any trouble with your maths, you can uh, consult with uh, tutors or lecturers who will be coming here inside that room. So, you can discuss about them so they can help you out. And uh, so I hope you all come again next week to listen to another talk by Philip. Okay. Thank you so much. If you want to continue to take it, thank you, Dr. Yun. Yeah. So it's off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's free, and this is very expensive. It's for quality. I haven't confirmed yet the date. Uh, I think I can confirm by this week. Just now, I think she wants to talk about that. I uh, think right, so she go back. What it? <coughs> no, uh, Mac Center. Uh, it's actually level of mathematics. Yeah, it's level, but uh, mostly they focus on first year and second year because first year and second year have the maths course. Third year you already finish. I, because I, if I need okay. extra finish. means... Uh, you can, you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. No problem. Okay, no. Thank you. You're okay, you